Joining us now, Democratic Congresswoman Abigail Spanberger of Virginia. She's a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and a former CIA caseworker. Jonathan Lemire and Mike Barnacle are still with us. And Congresswoman, I, I can't help but to, as we count down to hearing from President Zelensky himself, his address to Congress, I'm interested in what you think you might be hearing from him, but I'm also, it's not lost on all of us that what he's going to be asking for there's much of it that will not be delivered. Well, I think that it's important to first look at so much of the support that the United States has provided. We've rallied countries around the world, particularly unifying our NATO partners in support of sanctions, which are crippling the Russian economy, uh, the provision of javelins and stingers and intelligence and communication support and medical support um, have been incredibly important. Um, yet I do expect that President Zelensky will again raise the issue of MiG planes or potentially uh, surface to air missiles. And I think that it's important that the United States listen uh, to the needs that a wartime leader uh, is, is putting forth. Um, certainly we continue to see absolute horrible atrocities that the um, Putin's army is, is inflicting upon the Ukrainian people. And I believe the United States should be as absolutely supportive as we possibly can and give them what they need to win this war. Congresswoman, in terms of giving them what they need to win this war, could you speak uh, to the issue of technology that we might be contributing to the Ukrainians? It seems that the Russians have lost the ability, their command and control ability, which would mean that technology has intervened here and they can no longer speak through secret channels to one another. And that might be as a result of what we and other nations are lending them in technological terms. So certainly we've seen an, an, a significant advantage. While the Russians have thousands upon thousands of troops within Ukraine, we've seen the buildup of their convoys. We've seen their inability uh, to maintain the communication between uh, troop lines, between different groups. Um, and the Ukrainians have been extraordinary in their ability to take advantage of that. And so U.S. assistance and the assistance of our uh, partner nations in ensuring the Ukrainians have um, uh, an upper hand and certainly the ability to stay connected um, and ensure that the Russians are not is, is one that I think is um, contributing to this ongoing kind of just extraordinary uh, show of strength and resolve that we're seeing from the Ukrainian people and, and their military forces as well as their territorial defense. So, Congresswoman, the violence obviously has, has only picked up the wars at a, at a delicate phase, a potentially more, more terrible phase. Uh, but yet, at the same time, negotiations have begun between Russians and Ukrainians. There's both sides signaling there's at least a little bit of progress there, even if a deal is not yet reached. So, as we start to think about what the future may hold, and with some sort of end to this war and an off-ramp, perhaps, for Putin, how does the rest of the world re-engage with him, re-engage with Putin, re-engage with Russia after this war, considering what we're seeing now, all of these atrocities being committed across Ukraine. I mean, residential homes have been hit, children have been killed. What have been supposed to be humanitarian corridors have been struck. Maternity hospitals, they've taken a, a hospital hostage. Mm -hmm. uh, th this is not waging a war, these are war crimes. And so there becomes a distinct difference between how we re-engage with Russia and how we re-engage with Putin. And my personal opinion, and I think probably one that's shared by many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, is that Putin is a war criminal. Certainly we saw the United States Senate take that uh, stance with their votes and must be held accountable for the crimes that he's committed. Uh, and we have to have a long-term view of how we re-engage with Russia, its economy, and its people um, as we look past this, this war. But right now, the on-the-ground priority is to ensure that the Ukrainian people are able to win what is not just a fight for their own freedom, but a fight for democratic values everywhere. And following up on a report that we brought yesterday on the effectiveness Ukraine forces have had inflicting damage on Russian tanks using 
very basic Turkish-made drones. This morning, NBC News reports the Biden administration is now considering providing Ukraine with U.S.-made cutting-edge guided missiles called switchblades, which can accurately target tanks and artillery positions from miles away. The drones are essentially robotic smart bombs equipped with cameras, guidance systems, and explosives, and fly much faster than the Turkish TB2 drones that Ukraine has been using. Let's bring in right now NBC News correspondent sir, uh, covering national security and intelligence, Ken Delaney. And Ken, uh, you had a great report yesterday, but it, it led us to ask the question, why are we not doing more mm. in this in, in the space of, uh, of providing drones? Uh, we may have gotten our answer over the past 24 hours. Tell us what you're finding out. That's right, Joe. You weren't the only person asking that question. It was being asked in the halls of Congress, in the White House, and at the Defense Department. And we learned yesterday that, in fact, the Biden administration is considering providing these switchblade I call them killer drones. They call them loitering munitions. The video you just saw there was the smaller version, the Switchblade 300, which is really an anti-personnel weapon. Um, there's a bigger one that they were not even allowed to demonstrate for us when I went out to the Utah desert over the summer uh, and, and got an exclusive demonstration for NBC News. The bigger one can kill tanks. And it's not clear exactly which version of this or both that they're considering. There are a lot of questions, including how much training it would require for the Ukrainian and how fast the company Aerovironment can make these things, how many the U.S. has in their arsenal. But this could be a game-changing weapon, Joe. These things do what the U.S. predators and reapers can do with their Hellfire missiles much more cheaply and easily. They are small weapons that can be carted around the battlefield. The one you're looking at there, uh, it weighs five pounds and can be carried in a backpack. The larger one's a little bigger, but it's still it's man-portable. They launch them out of tubes, and uh, the the bigger one can go up to 50 miles to the target. So, you know, we've given the Ukrainians javelins that they can use to blow up tanks. You have to get pretty close with a javelin, about a mile away. So you expose yourself to, to air fire and ground fire. These things almost have a mind of their own. And they can loiter, wow. hover over a target uh, until that target presents itself. So, you know, the U.S. has used these in combat, but in a very limited way, we are told. And they don't talk about it. So if these things are used to any great extent in the Ukraine theater, it could be a, a real historic moment for warfare, and it could be a game changer for Ukraine. Th th those are extraordinary to mention. Ken, did you say five pounds? Yeah, the smaller one you're seeing there, it's the Switchblade 300, five pounds. Wow. It literally was the size of a toy drone I got for my kids. I held it in my hands, and then they launched it, and they showed me how they were able to put it through the window of a truck. And, you know, it's designed to be discriminating, that version. So they, they said, you know, we could kill the driver, but not the passenger in a sort of a CIA targeted strike scenario. But the bigger one, which they mm -hmm. didn't show us, you know, could blow up a tank or an armored vehicle, uh, could do the same kind of thing that these Turkish drones are doing, but uh, much faster, more elusive, um, more dangerous, I would say. So NBC's Ken Delenian, thank you so much for that report. Congresswoman Abigail Spanberger, just how important could this be to the Ukrainian war strategy? Uh, they would be game changing. I mean, we've already seen the Ukrainians have made incredible use of the Turkish provided drones, which, as Ken mentioned, are just a, a different technology, not nearly as as targeted as uh, as the American version, uh, the American drones. Uh, so to be able to enable them to attack, let's say, the tank lines, for example, that have been built up around Kiev, uh, it w provides them such an important advantage. And the fact that they could do it from much further away would be a, a significant impact on protecting their own forces. Uh, so you know, I'm supportive of, of this uh, potential transfer, and I hope that it's one that we'll uh, see expedited and move forward. Congresswoman, are you concerned about who would operate these drones and where, what location they would operate them from? So these drones would be operated uh, from within Ukraine, and that's an important 
distinction operated by Ukrainians. And some of the challenges that we have faced thus far in providing weapon systems and providing, be they defensive or offensive, um, to the Ukrainians has been a question of whether or not they have the ability to utilize them. That's why um, we have seen a pivot towards uh, Soviet style or you know, earlier generation forms of weapons that their soldiers know how to utilize. Um, but the important thing here is that this would be a, a, a capability that the Ukrainians themselves on the ground in Ukraine would be able to leverage for their own defense and to, you know, use as a significant advantage against the Russian army, which numbers wise is is more numerous. But um, when we look at the, the heart and the dedication that the Ukrainians are bringing to their fight for freedom, um, it's extraordinary. And, and that's why I support ensuring that they have the tools they need to be able to to defend themselves, their country and ultimately democracy.